Well, a significant amount of the earliest memories I have revolve around cars. There was something about the sound and uh, the power they have that both scared and attracted me. Um, one of the first things I did when I had my first pocket money is go out and buy a car magazine. Um, and that didn't happen once, it turned into a weekly habit uh, of going to the gas station and uh, buying a certain car magazine and uh, reading it front and back. And um, yeah, as, um, uh, as little boys grow, um, their uh, uh, dreams uh, grow with them. And um, soon I learned that I didn't want to belong, uh, I didn't want to stay in the place where I uh, grew up. Um, like uh, Somaya just mentioned before me, um, I didn't feel like I belonged there and I just wanted to travel and get away. Um, I think it's something that's also, that was in my genes. Um, my grandfather was an international bus driver. My father uh, flew 12 hours just to marry his holiday romance, uh, which is my mother. And uh, my mother also drove 300 kilometers every single day just to get to and from work. So um, yeah, I just grew up at, uh, um, that it's normal to uh, own a car and to drive everywhere you need to go. So when I was 18 years of age, um, I got my driver's license and uh, I quickly also had my first car. Um, I got the keys. Um, I didn't have any driving fear. The first thing I did was uh, drive to Maastricht, a city in the south of the Netherlands, on the, the first uh, day. On the second day, um, I uh, thought Maastricht wasn't far enough, so I went to Antwerp in Belgium. And I remember really feeling like, now I'm finally free. Um, that's what I thought at the time. Um, my driving a car turned into more or less of an addiction. Um, I started uh, tuning cars, um, uh, optimizing the suspension, uh, going to racetracks, uh, building my own track car. And um, yeah, basically cars were a very big part of my life. Um, in uh, the first 15 years after getting my driver's license, I drove the best part of a million kilometers. So um, yeah, I really spent some, uh, some time uh, behind the wheel. Um, then in 2016, my life changed drastically because my uh, son was born. Um, and when that happens, um, you suddenly learn that life is not about exploring the world and enjoying yourself, but it suddenly turns into something that's about uh, making it possible for your son to enjoy the world, explore life and um, have a wonderful, fu wonderful future. Um, Along with that um, experience um, came a sense of responsibility. I suddenly felt like um, I need to make sure that he actually has a future and that he has the same choices as I had, at least. Um, and with this um, realization also came uh, uh, the, the first cracks in my uh, petrol headism uh, 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 came up because I suddenly realized like me driving a car is actually influencing his life. Um, so at one point, um, well, life goes on, so um, at one point I uh, was watching the news in the morning and I heard stuff about the emission scandal, uh, Dieselgate, that was uh, going on at the time. And um, well, uh, I drank my coffee, um, got into my car and started going to work. And I suddenly realized that the trip I was making to work was only partly paid for. I mean, my employer took care of the diesel that was in my car, so the fuel was perfectly paid. But I suddenly understood that with the emissions my car was um, uh, sending out, um, that would mean that my son would have to pay for a part of my ride um, from his future paycheck. And I suddenly felt like, well, what am I doing? But um, yeah, I really felt like I don't have a choice because, well, I had to go to work. Work was 40 kilometers from home. Um, so there's no choice except you drive a car. Um, life continued. My son started to uh, go to a nursery because uh, um, my uh, former wife and I both uh, had a job. So uh, well, he had to stay somewhere during the day. And um, in the area where, area where I live now, uh, the Rotterdam region, um, traffic is really bad. Uh, Basically, um, my uh, daily commute would vary between 45 and 90 minutes. So often, um, I, would be, I would find myself racing home 
um, trying to get to the nursery in time, um, sliding into the parking lot five minutes too late. And this stress really gets to you. It, it really uh, made me come home every day tired, hungry, and frustrated. It even got worse. Um, since puberty, um, I've, um, I managed to take a lot of self-confidence from my tall and sleek look. Um, I just I had this posture, I saw it as an asset, and um, it was in my mind like, well, that's something at least I can build on. And one morning I was in the bedroom, uh, I was trying to close my uh, button of my shirt, and it didn't want to close. So I thought, maybe I did it in the wrong, uh, I shifted it a bit or something. Um, so I went to the bathroom, went to the mirror, and I was looking, and I thought, there's something really here. And I really felt disappointed, I really thought like, um, it's, I'm well into my 30s and my body has just stopped trying to hide my age. So for a couple of weeks I was thinking like, well, maybe should I, should I just accept the fact that I'm, well, turning old? And then I suddenly thought, well, I want to um, uh, enjoy life together with my son. Uh, I want to see him grow up, but I also want to be able to um, play football with him when he's uh, 15 or maybe even 20. And um, if he gets children, I want to be a granddad. So I thought, in order to do this, I need to make sure that I am still healthy in 30 years from now. Um, so, well, I, um, um, I didn't accept the fact that I was uh, uh, getting uh, in a worse shape. Um, I didn't have a choice but to go to the gym. So uh, I subscribed to a gym uh, like a lot of you probably uh, uh, have done. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I had the subscription and I sponsored them for uh, about a year. But I was really thinking at one point, like, do people actually go there? I mean, um, I really didn't have time to go anywhere. I was in the Metropolitan Red Race. Uh, I was dad of a young child. Um, there's just no way to do it. And then at one point I got a project in Leiden, which is 28 kilometers from my home. And um, someone jokingly said, well, that's basically cycling distance. And well, I'm Dutch, so um, uh, even though I thought it wasn't a viable option, I thought, you know what, let's see what I can do. So what happened then is I uh, started looking at my options and I found uh, this option here, um, which is called a speed pedelec. It's basically a normal bicycle, but uh, electric. Um, and what it does uh, is it has a license, so it's uh, a bit like a moped. Um, the power you put into the pedals, uh, it multiplies it by five, um, so you can go 45 kilometers an hour with it uh, as a cruise speed. And I thought maybe that's for me. Um, especially the um, agility and acceleration are really nice. So if you're in a, um, uh, in a really large city or in a... Um, in a mountainous country like Spain or Portugal, um, it's really a nice bike to ride. But then I um, met some people who told me about this bike. And um, at first I liked its, uh, its, uh, well, its quirky uh, uh, banana shape. And um, then I thought, well, it doesn't have an engine, it's fully human powered and there's a charm to that. And um, I also started thinking like, well, if I'm in here, um, like I said, I'm Dutch, so I'm used to rain. But in this thing, um, the rain doesn't harm me. And um, so I opted for this and uh, I just uh, started trying. And um, basically, um, at first, it was really hard. I really had a hard time. I was uh, cycling 90 minutes, struggling to find a route um, uh, for 28 kilometers. So I wasn't really quicker than a normal bicycle. Um, and I was trying to keep up appearances, but um, yeah, I was really struggling with muscle pain and I almost gave up. And then suddenly after two or three weeks, it got easier and it was as if my body had more or less accepted like, hey, um, we're going to do this every day now, so well, let's do it then. Um, and I also fairly quickly um, got to, um, well, traveling to work in 70 minutes. Uh, and I started suddenly noticing I'm losing weight. So that's kind of a motivation to keep going. Um, early 2019, 
um, I was suddenly traveling to work in less than an hour. And I also started to realize that um, with this bike, whether it rains or it's dry, whether it's warm or cold, um, whether it's a super busy uh, morning or um, it's a public holiday, it doesn't really matter um, uh, uh, for your travel time. Um, where earlier I had the difference between 45 and 90 minutes um, uh, on my way to go home. Uh, with this bike I would just leave at 5 o'clock, um, be at the nursery at 5 minutes to 6 every single day. I was just meeting my deadlines, so I got really happy with, uh, with my decision. So, yeah, I started thinking, how far can I take this? How far can I go with this bike? Well, it turns out quite far. Um, I um, used to work at a company which is 80 kilometers from my home. Um, that was doable, but not uh, for a very long term. Currently, I work 53 kilometers from home, uh, and I can ride it stable in one hour and 50 minutes any day of the week. Um, and, um, well, um, basically, if I take a car, it takes me one hour to get there, um, if I'm lucky. Um, and then there's someone who um, was very important to the development of this bike. Uh, who once told me like, well, uh, so I'm spending 30 minutes more per day. Um, so um, I'm managing to um, uh, put two and a half hours of sports into 30 minutes per day, which is a really nice concept. So to summarize, um, my travel time has got much more stable. Um, my shape improved a lot. Um, I suddenly didn't have an um, ecolog ecological footprint from uh, going to work anymore. Um, I'm happier, I'm more emotionally stable, um, and I'm also more energetic, which is something that really surprised me since I'm spending a lot of energy every day. And it could be that you're still stuck in traffic, but at least it's not because of me anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, some of you will probably think like, well, all this cycling stuff is very dangerous. And um, I started to think of this uh, from the perspective of my son. Because if I look at, uh, look at this from uh, the perspective of, of a five-year-old, um, a bike like this or like this is a lot less thre threatening than a big SUV. And if I'm in this bike or on this bike, um, he cannot get into my blind spot because basically I don't have any. Um, while a car is uh, actually dangerous for a pedestrian, a cyclist, and also for fellow motorists. Um, because you feel vulnerable uh, on a bicycle, um, it actually made me drive a car better um, because I drive less fast, um, I'm less easily dis distracted, and um, I adopted a more defensive driving style. And um, if you look at all those advantages, there's uh, one thing left, and that's the cost. Um, uh, a lot of people are literally horrified when I tell them that um, for the price of a small and, uh, and cheap car, uh, all you get is a bike. Um, and I was thinking, like, I wanted to bore you all with um, a presentation on um, how, especially the Venomobile, is really a good piggy bank. You can really save a lot of money with it. But then when I was cycling here, I uh, saw the gas station, and... Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have to explain anything else anymore. Um, so, um, to end my presentation, um, it's not like I'm asking you to go out tomorrow and buy one of these bikes. Uh, I mean, um, I don't think that's a, um, yeah, uh, a wise, wise thing to do. But what I would like to do is ask you, um, the next time you want to get into a car, or the next time um, you find a new job and your, job, uh, your employer says, I have a free company car for you, um, please consider the actual cost and um, Truly consider your options. Um, spend your time well. Thank you very much.